for this uh, project about giving diverse communities uh, the tools to work on their well-being, uh, for educators to pass on all the tools we have worked on, and educate them on how to support diverse communities, inclusion, belonging, and well-being. Uh, in the process, we keep youth to be active citizens, encourage them to build uh, inclusive diverse communities where everyone is welcome and come back. Uh, our target groups are youth workers and educators, youth from immigrant backgrounds, youth from native communities, and policy stakeholders. Uh, our first result is the Good Practice Guide, which empowers youth educators to motivate diverse youth groups to learn, participate, and socialize by providing good practice, examples, and showing approaches to engage youth. Our second is the Open Education Resources, uh, equipping community and youth educators to own young people's well-being and celebrate the positive effects of diverse communities. Uh, the third is Youth Clubs, uh, cultivate a supportive environment where youth from diverse backgrounds can gain confidence, uh, civic participation, future planning, socializing, communication, mindfulness, and digital skills. Our last one is the platform and online course, uh, digital access to information learning and building closer relationships. Uh, here are all my partners on this. Uh, we are led by Sweden, uh, Folk, Folk University. Uh, we have partners from Spain, Ramblies, Youth Power Denmark, La Lava, France, Momentum here in Ireland, outside uh, Germany, European E Leader, uh, I mean Learning Institute in Denmark, and they're all here today because we're actually having a two-day transnational meeting, and some of them are here for the first time in Nature, I think. So, a hand to all of you for coming here. <laughs> and then coming soon, we'll have our good practice guide, so you can follow our journey at wellpudding.eu. Thank you. to read out uh, a short part of the book and this is the part where Zach who didn't speak a word of English at the time um, hears something uh, from the captain as he's landed but particularly these are his words as he sees Ireland for the first time. As the captain came on the intercom and said something I didn't understand and the plane slowly got closer to the ground everything started to take on its true shape. The houses looked nothing like the mud houses in Altash camp they were beautiful. Everything around them was so healthy, so full of life. It all looked amazing. I couldn't wait to get off the plane, to walk outside, to be in this place and breathe in the air. I could tell we were going to like it here. So Zach, tell us your story about how you ended up coming to Lovely Beatrum. Right, first of all, um, my parents are originally from Kurdistan of Iran. Um, obviously Kurdistan was Divided uh, in the 1920s, so it's only 100 years this year. Uh, we were promised a country, but it never happened, thanks to France and Great Britain. And, um, we're, and we have, uh, there's over 40 million Kurds in the Middle East, 40 to 50 million. And there's close to 4 million Kurdish refugees in, uh, in, in Europe in general, so we have over 2 million Kurds in Germany. Um, yeah, so same thing again. Back in uh, back in 1980, Iraq-Iran war started. That went on for eight years. And Iraq invaded uh, the first sea they invaded was Kurdistan of Iran. Around 13, 15,000 15, people were moved out of their homes by the by the Iraqi regime. And it's no difference what's happening between Ukraine and Russia and that's why we have a lot of Ukrainians here in Ireland and the same thing happened to us, my parents were told to move on and my parents had a great life uh, before, before they, were, they moved on to a refugee camp in Iraq they had a great life, they had everything you know, um, they had a luxury life by comparison to the 70s, 60s and you could have everything in life, they had everything in life except democracy because, because they're uh, their identity, they were Kurds, and so they ended up in a refugee camp. Uh, they lived in a tent in Kurdistan of Iraq for about nine months, 
and then the Iraqi government found out that these were Kurds, they weren't Persian, and they said because they already had trouble, the Iraqi government had trouble with the Kurdish people in northern Iraq. So they decided to put 13,000 people in the back of army trucks, brought them down to the middle of nowhere, it was like a desert, um, in Ramadi, and they were put in the tents, so they lived in tents for close to 13 months there. And a lot of older people I talked to, they, they keep saying they thought they were brought down there to be killed because between 1980 and 1988, 180,000 Kurdish people went missing and to this day they haven't been found. And they thought the same things were going to happen. And even to this day, a lot of Kurdish people from that city where we are from went missing. And nobody knows where they are to, to, even to, to this day. And, and then in 1986, my parents decided um, the Ayatollah of Iran had a fatwa it was to say the Kurds we were the devil or we were the worst than the Jews in the Middle East of so on and so my parents ended up uh, joining the Kurdish rebellion so that went on for two, two years and at that time my dad only had five six kids there were eight brothers and two sisters and even he went for a fight for Kurdistan you know he survived when the war stopped in 1988, back to refugee camp. Then, um, back to refugee camp, we couldn't go back to Iran, obviously because of the war, and if we went back, they would probably got killed, because a lot of people went back from the refugee camp to Iran, got executed. A lot of my man's uncles got executed when they went back to Iran, because they said they were traitors. Even civilians were going back, they were down as traitors and they were getting killed because back then there was no social media, there was no nothing, just because we are Kurds as well, you treat you differently. And, and when, it came, when after the, the 20 years that your parents were living in, in that camp then, you were promised many times to be able to come to Ireland, weren't you? When the, first, the time you actually came to Leitrim and came to Ireland, there had been many promises before that. Yeah, so... Yeah, so we are meant to come to Ireland in 2002 and then my dad worked for an oil company over there and some Arab sheikh got my job and so then what happened then um, there was two, two companies were fighting each other and the company my dad was working for his side was about 150 of them the court cases only lasted two hours all of them in prison and my dad was in and out of prison for you know 15, 16 months, and I remember even visiting him when I was a, you know when I was 10 years of age, and we used to go to Abu Ghraib prison, and it was difficult, you know, when you're young because every day when you're going home, your mom would be saying, "Oh, he's coming home next week or tomorrow and tomorrow," and that dragged on for over 16 months, and it's it was tough. But thankfully, then he got out, and we had. Even back then, we had to lucky we had a lot of relations in um, in Europe, and one of my mom's cousins actually won the Danish lotto there years ago. Um, so he was sending a lot of money and tried to bribe the prison. You know, corruption was high in Iraq, and he got him out. And then uh, then he came to Ireland as a political program refugee, like all the other Kurdish people that ended up in Ireland and around the world. Um, and life just begins in Leitrim in 2002 and when I came over here I didn't speak a word of English and, and here we are today. <laughs> You're doing pretty well at it now anyways, like that, that's for sure. I was, um, I was looking at a Department of Justice video that you're featured in and in it you say in particular that a big barrier of going to school in Leitrim at the time was that, as you say, you didn't have a word of English. And there's a lovely picture of you and two of your brothers. Um, all, you know, were s sitting there and there's a green field behind you. Then you have your ties on, the uniform is on and you're ready to go. How do you start create, forging friendships and, and belonging in the community when you don't have the language? Where do you start? Um, it was difficult from the start. Um, plus, going back previously, Difficult life in a refugee camp. Some days we go to school with no runners, with nothing. Um, even if it used to be 50 kids, we playing, we playing football and we fight over one ball. But that ball brought us all together, all the people. And the camp was very multicultural. There's a lot of people from different religions, different sectors, but we're all Kurds. Different, um, 
But um, and it was the same thing, you know. Obviously coming over here, I remember my parents was like, "You better gain him for a fall," and they were delighted, and we were delighted as well. We were starting school, but the next thing was when we started in school, didn't really speak any English. All we knew was hi, how are you? Really, that was the, and the kids were trying to um, kind of communicate, communicate with me, and it was just. I was just lost, you know, and then my parents used to say, look, if you learn one word a day, you'll be flying by the end of the year, and that was, and so I kind of listened to that, I took that to my head, so every day I was there one day, and then picking up, start playing hurling football and soccer, and my English improved a lot more quicker, and so here I am today. <laughs> Well, it, it's interesting, I read in the book as well, that, that your first football match you played like a soccer match because you weren't really sure of the rules. So you didn't pick up the ball in case it was illegal, you just kept kicking it. Yeah, that's that's 100% true. Like I, you wrote it now here, it's not like, <laughs> <laughs> not like I'm telling you something. I actually I still have that video at home, I remember the, the parents taped it, and still have it, it was we played in beside Carrigan Channel Community School, and it was an under 12 match, and it was just, I was just playing soccer and <laughs> going around. And I think everybody else was like, what is he at? <laughs> but I got a goal, so I said it. So. It, it does, doesn't matter what you did in that case. You also, of course, you went on to play for Limerick. Or sorry, Leitrim. Jeez, I nearly got really full power. Good thing I caught myself there and that was pointed out. So you went on to play for Leitrim, checking. Um, and of course, GA then was, was a big part of your life, continues to be. Would you particularly say that GA is a place for everyone, that there is a home there for everyone? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, what I've noticed uh, with the GA, and uh, everybody knows each other. It's a small, it's kind of, to me, it's like a small charity organisation organization but in a bigger picture it's a big organization and I think the GA keeps this country together and keeps keeps their people on their toes uh, keeps the local community on their toes and everybody watches out for each other and even I play with Thomas Davis GA club in Tala and people say Tala is huge but when I moved there Tala is actually small because everybody knows each other and everybody keeps an eye on each other and and even all the jobs I've got was always through GA and I've got a lot, a lot of my friends, jobs, family members, through GA. Any job I've got was always through GA and even all the, because I always say there's 20 lads in the team, you know, there's always five or six lads, their parents own businesses and they, they, look, they always look after the rest of the lads and that's what I've noticed in Thomas Davis GA club and I've even noticed with even, you know, in St. Mary's in Carrick, you know, and a lot of people up there have kids playing up there. It's like Paul Mays and Dunsbar and, and uh, Kenny Mortis Mort Pope. And I've noticed they employ a lot of the people that play in the GA club. So it's, it's the same thing, nothing different compared to Tala or Lintrum or, you know, I've noticed that uh, the GA, and it's great because it's voluntary organisation, so everybody puts a lot of work in, and which is great, and keeps people on their toes, and which is a great thing, and keeps people uh, keeps young people off the street. It's the largest amateur organisation in the country, as, as you know, and definitely as, well, I'm a, I'm a sister of a hurler, and I also married a footballer, so um, neither of who would appreciate me telling you that, by the way, but anyway. Um, and I definitely see, I see exactly what you mean, but actually, one time, Zach, I probably saw it most up front, was not in Croke Park, or was not in Parky Cueve, or was not in Ireland but I was at the Asian GAA Games in Bangkok a couple of years ago and um, when there was hundreds of people, Irish people from all over Asia coming to kick the ball around the field. I wouldn't quite call it now your standard, but at the same time, as you say, it really does bring people together. But speaking of bringing people together, you're one of 13 and you mentioned in the book as well that you could have come to Ireland earlier if your parents were willing to split the family up, but they weren't willing to do that. And I quote, you say in the book, that was one of the best decisions they ever made. That sounds like, picking up on Paul's passion and emotion, that's a big statement to make. What does that really mean to you? Um, because they have gone through, you know, eight years of wars, they survived, some of their friends died in the war, and even my mum, you know, even up to last year, hadn't seen her sister in 27 years. And she came over there last year and visited because my mum hates traveling and her hates, sister hates traveling as well. So she decided to get on a car and come over to, you know, France and England and took her a day nearly. But um, 
because uh, because all their family and friends were divided, you know, in the war, some of them ended up in Australia. Some of my aunts, sisters, been to Sweden in the 1990s, and Norway, you know, Canada. So they have relations all over the place, and, and so the reason for that was, and they said, if we leave some of the family members behind. They could end up anywhere in the world, and you just wouldn't know what would happen to them. And so I think it was the best decision they ever made. They kept the family united, kept us all together until we, came up, until we moved to Ireland. And because what happened to a lot of our families, um, because they were big families, and they were splitting up, or some of them were getting married, and some of them, some of my parents never let any of the, the older brothers or sisters settle down, because what happened, you got settled down, have kids, you weren't part of the family, you were moved out, and you wouldn't have been able to go to the same place if you wanted it. So, so that's the best decision they ever made, and now we all live in Tala. I mean, Bert lives in Sweden last, last 11, 12 years with the recession hit in Ireland. He went over there, another brother went over. He didn't like it, he liked Ireland, so he came back. Um, so, here we are. It is great, you have a GA team there in the backyard, by the sound of it, if you're ever stuck for a few subs. And uh, I was struck as well in the book too, Zach, how many Irish references you have to your story. So, at one stage, um, Zach describes the border between Iraq and Iran as a few pucks of a ball away. And I was just interested about how clearly you've really, you know, you really take it to Irish culture and, and the, the layers that you've applied to it. But can I ask, what parallels do you see between Irish and Kurdish culture? Um, we have gone through the same history as the Irish people, and I don't think there's any differences about colonization and forcing them to change their language. Um, obviously, ethnic cleansing. We have the same history. You know, even our music. You know, we love music and drinking and tea. There's a lot of. You know, we have. You know, obviously, you know, Ireland got their own country since 1916, but Kurdistan. We only have Kurdistan of Iraq at the minute. It's a regional government, but we're still part of Iraq. And war can start any day over there. And same with uh, we have Kurdistan of Syria since 2011. The Kurds of Syria. We have over three to four million Kurds there, and these Kurdish people are being treated differently. Um, since 1923, or we go back to the 18th centuries, even 90% of Kurds, we weren't Muslims. Um, Islam was forced on us by, you know, uh, the Iraqi Arabs and the Syrian Arabs. I'm not saying they're all bad people. I have a lot of Arab friends. Um, but about Kurdish history, you know, so it's the same. We have the same history as Irish people. And Kurdish people still, we're, we're fighting out for our identity. And unfortunately, we don't have friends. We always say we have mountains in Kurdistan. It's the mountains that save us from ethnic cleansing and from these Arab, certain Arab countries and the Turks and the Iranians. Obviously, you see in this year, uh, sorry, last year, it was 70 days ago, uh, when an Iranian girl, but her hair was sticking out, and she was killed. The reason was that because she was a Kurd. And and they forget now, you won't get away with that in these days because social media has a big say. Social media has the power over everybody now these days. And, and over, over 5 million Kurds protesting in Iran, there's over 1,000 people have died. And I have relations, uh, friends that were arrested protesting, some of them lost their lives. And, and we always say, where is the international outcry? There is no international outcry, you know. We have an Iranian embassy here, Turkish embassy here. They're worse than ISIS. They say ISIS are bad, the Taliban are bad, you know. And there is no inter international outcry. We all we do is we can demand on on Twitter, you know, you know. We say Turkey, like Macron, France, always say Turkey is the biggest supporters of jihadis and ISIS. But at the same time, two weeks later, they're shaking hands and sitting down, you know, having a party. So you just. Kurdish people, we're lost in the Middle East. We lost over 40,000 people fighting ISIS. We're fighting for the world. And at the same time then, you know, a couple of years later, 2017, 2019, NATO gives Turkey the green line to attack the Kurds. 200,000 Kurdish people become homeless. Uh, you know, Turkey invades Afrin. Then uh, uh, Palestinian government funds uh, uh, funds uh, building houses in Afrin, the city in Kurdistan of Syria, bringing Arab refugees right into the into their homes, 
and the Kurdish people, 200,000 people, are living in Kurdistan and Iraq in a tense. So the whole world is it's a mess. And it's when you say about the Kurdish people are lost, the last, on the very, very back of the book here, it says, I am living proof of the Cave Mila Falsha. How has Ireland treated you? But see, this is the thing. When we're in Ireland, we're treated equally and treated as any other Irish person here. And everybody, you know, it's democracy. We have democracy here. That's the big difference. And and Ireland is, you know, they just, we have Kurdish skills set up. So Kurdish kids, you know, second generation, they could go and learn Kurdish and learn about their history. And But in Kurdistan of Iran, a girl there, her name was Zahra Mohammadi. She was teaching Kurdish in her house to seven Kurdish kids. She gets five years in prison, you know. And, um, you know, they try to ban Kurdish music. They try to... It's, I don't know, it's, it's heartbreaking, you know, because there's 40 million Kurdish people in, in the Middle East. They live in fair, you know, and obviously, because we have, you know, I'm not saying all Arabs are bad people, or all, all Turks are bad people, but at the same time, there's over, you know, 60 million Turks, you have 20 million Kurds there, and the 60 million Turks, at a young age, are taught to hate Kurds. So it's the biggest racism in the world is in Turkey. You know, there, to me, people say, do you get racial abuse in Ireland and all that? I'm like, people obsess with soaps and the anger of this and that. It wouldn't really bother me. I wouldn't even, that's, you know, I'm like, I'm worried what's happening in the Middle East. We get killed, you know? Over here, someone says something because of their drink problem or drink or something involved, you know? At the end of the day, you know, we wouldn't even call that racism. But I know there is a small percentage of racism in Ireland as well. Well, to say it's living proof of the Gateway of Falls certainly sounds a very positive thing, and, and um, I think that that's you know that that is really important to hear that directly directly from you. I'm just going to stop here and just ask if there's any questions for Zach before I ask my final one. Yep, a lady there at the back. I just love I have three questions, but I move around. <laughs> I wanted to ask. I would ask you so many questions, but I'm interested to ask you how did you track the belonging? You obviously. Belong. You belong in so many communities. You, you have so many uh, things that make your identity, and I'm similar, but I'm always interested to find out how someone else has um, made the formula for belonging. What would you say to some young, new uh, person coming from the same situation? How do they start belonging in the community? What do they need to do, and what do they need to expect from others? So just to uh, repeat that, just for anybody who would like to uh, just hear that again. So in essence, the, the question is that you belong in so many communities. What do you say to somebody who is seeking to belong today? What do they need to do? Just like how you cracked belonging. Um, I'm trying to, if I compare it to coming to Leach 20 years ago, the people were very welcoming. I know the country was cold. The country is a cold country, but the people are very warm, you know? And Ireland is a great country, but we need more, um, we need, obviously, we need to, you know, if a family are coming from Syria, you know, we need to, you know, go over and talk to them, you know, that, that, you know, it doesn't cost money to talk Be to curious. people. curious. Yeah. And, and, and help them out, see what they need, you know, and obviously I think what the, the big issue is that the last uh, couple of years, the last 10 years, and I know they say, well, I've noticed, you know, when they came over here, obviously, you know, there was, you know, the country was, was booming, and there's people who are happy, you know. Um, but Ireland's still a rich country, you know, there should be, able, there should be fundings for, you know, obviously there's different voluntary organizations that help, that help people, and I just think we need to, like, invite them into our libraries, tell them about the culture, and learn about their culture as well. And it's when we came over here, it was completely different, obviously, as well. You know, and I was I was young, but um, and obviously when I was playing Gaelic, it was the uh, Paddy's supermarket. Uh, Paddy and Goldrick, you know, gave my brother and sister jobs and didn't speak any English, you know. And another brother got a job in the cash and carry up in beside Kennedy's petrol station. Another bro was working in Horizons, I think it's called, in Kevin Shan as well, a restaurant, I think that's the area. yeah. So we got jobs, it was very quick, we were integrated into, into Irish life. Um, but I, there's still a lot, good bit of that work going on, 
for them, um, not enough. And and obviously, you know, Ireland's a small country as well. I know people are protesting certain small minority in Dublin and and it's terrible to see as well and I think it's I blame the government because I've, I've noticed in Ireland it's very, very hard to get anything done in the last 10, 15 years. I have a friend of mine from Leitrim who's trying to build a house in Leitrim Village there. Eventually he got planning permission now after three years, you know. And I'm like, they built the Burj Khalifa in Dubai in nine months and there's 3,000 people living in it. And I think that's where the issue is and we, you know, the problem is everything's so slow, we're trying to do things, and I think the country, we have fallen behind because every time we're trying to build an apartment block, it's taken two years, which years ago it wasn't like that because of, I think social media has changed things as well. Uh, if Fianna Fáil wanted to build 5,000 houses in Dublin, Sinn Féin will object. If Sinn Féin wants to build their Fine Gael will object, and the whole thing is on hold. And the problem is now, I've even friends that are from Tala, they can't buy anywhere because there's nowhere to live. But the problem is, they're trying to blame refugees and immigrants. There's nothing got to do with that. Because they're not living in apartments. They're all in centres and they're all in sports halls and they're all in hotels. And that's what I think where, where, where the big issue is. And it's very easy fixed, you know. You know, get building, build houses, build skyscrapers if you have to build them. And we see you south of the skyscraper soon in Carrick and Shannon by the South of it. Um, well, Zach, thank you very much for coming coming to us today and for sharing your story with us. Uh, it's an intriguing read, I have to say. It's um, it's also I find both an emotive and descriptive read as well to, to see see the world, but particularly the way you describe Ireland. I'm delighted I'm living here myself. Uh, it's a, it's a lovely perspective indeed. So, ladies and gentlemen, Zach Riley.